Hey guys, Kim here. You are tuned back into Kim E, the Diabetes MP. If you are new here, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I want to tell you a little bit what you're going to find here. So typically on my channel, on my platforms, I am a person who speaks about diabetes, all things diabetes. I'm a family nurse practitioner as well as a diabetes educator. And I speak to diabetes management and chronic disease management through the lens of the clinician, all clinicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, or uh, pharmacists, um, even physicians, you know. And so I try to speak to anyone that's a healthcare professional and how we can deliver more quality, better quality care to our patients and just have a dialogue. You know, I give my commentary on things and I try to keep my community up to date. OK, so if you go and you look at all of my platforms, you're going to see I talk about diabetes. But today I am bringing to you guys something that I have been wanting to talk about for a while. OK, and you may be able to see right up here, trying to yep, see right there, um, that icon that says the health of the culture. So I want to welcome you guys to my new segment, the health of the culture. Okay. And so welcome. Okay. So why did I decide to start this new venture? Okay. So for those who have been following me, I'm going to still talk about um, diabetes. I'm not going to switch and do something totally different. So whatever brought you here, you're still going to be able to get that. But the reason why I wanted to speak more broader about chronic disease and the management and education is because, like I mentioned, I'm a family nurse practitioner. OK, and, you know, I am not I don't consider myself a diabetes nurse practitioner. I mean, my moniker is Kim E, the diabetes MP, because that has been um, a focus of mine because many of my patients are rather at risk for diabetes or they have diabetes. But honestly, my day to day, I manage everything. OK, now I do currently work in an environment where I have a more uh, focused demographic. You know, um, I typically work with end stage uh, kidney disease and chronic kidney disease, which many of you all know diabetes is the leading cause for chronic kidney disease. So that was one of the reasons why I made the move to this organization that I'm working with. But I have had a feeling to speak more about more than just diabetes. OK, now something that's different about me that you will probably you probably won't see with a lot of different other people um, is that my every day in and day out, like I've mentioned, is not just diabetes or even endocrine related conditions. I talk to my patients about everything. I function as a family nurse practitioner. Now, being that diabetes is one of those conditions that the majority of my patients have, it has been very beneficial for me to speak to diabetes, hence why I wanted to go for the certification and become a diabetes educator. But I don't work in just a diabetes clinic. I don't work in just an endocrinology office. Nothing's wrong with that. If that's what people want to do, that's fine. But for me, my biggest focus has been quality of care. It has been chronic disease management because diabetes tends to run alongside other chronic diseases. So it's just not a one trick pony. I'm not a one trick pony. And I wanted to be able to bring more of that to you all. You may be asking yourself, why do you want to do that, Kim? Well, again, if you have followed me for any amount of time, I've been making content online, like officially as Kim E, the diabetes MP since 2019. So here we are in 2023. That's almost four years. We're coming up on four years of me launching my YouTube channel and my social media platforms as the Diabetes MP. And just to be quite honest with you, I find there are other um, there are other subjects that I want to talk about and that I have knowledge over. OK, so just to give you a little bit of background of me, some of you all may know this already, but for those who don't, you know, again, like I said, I'm a family nurse practitioner, proud of that. I'm also a diabetes educator. OK, um, 
what a lot of people don't know about my work history is that it was very diverse. I have worked in a number of different um, settings. I have done inpatient. I have done outpatient. I have done boutique clinics. Um, I have done cash pay only clinics. I have done long-term care, right? I've done NICU. A lot of people don't know that my very first job as a nurse was in the NICU, okay? I started out doing a lot of critical care um, and then decided to go back to school and do outpatient for personal reasons, but you know, I didn't want to work in the hospital. That just wasn't my cup of tea. But that was the, the path that I chose for myself. But when I was working as a registered nurse, I always worked in, you know, critical care, ICU, uh, trauma step down. It was always like a specialized unit, right? Um, also, I have a lot of experience in leadership, especially healthcare leadership. Um, some of you may know that I have a consulting business, an education consulting firm, where I actually help organizations and clinics build out their their programs their clinical programming as well as sustain that programming so i'm really really big into community health and really really big in the 65 and older community chronic disease management all of these things i bring to the table and i started to feel like i was boxing myself in so again, I'm going to continue to talk about diabetes, education, and management. So don't feel like I'm transitioning out of that. I'm not. But I want to have also an outlet where I'm able to come and speak to you all about hot topics in healthcare. Um, I want to be able to speak about specific things, you know, and this really be more like a show style where it has segments and we talk about things. So that's what this is all about. And so if you have made it through this at this point, um, I've been speaking for some minutes now. If you've made it to this point, welcome. OK. All right. This is going to be a very laid back environment. It's not going to be academia. It's not going to be um like you're sitting through a lecture. If you've known me for any amount of time, you've listened to any of my content, that's just not me. If you want that, you can find that in other people. But for me, especially in this space and platform, I want it to be laid back. I want you to look at me as like, we're just talking as colleagues, chopping it up. And maybe I've read an article that I want to share with you all. And it's not like very stuffy. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, matter of fact, did you know about this? Or this is what's going on. And I want to also have you all to, I want to encourage you all to also get down in the comments. Tell me what you think, you know? And also, if there's anything that you want me to press on, again, by doing this show, this series, this I really want it to be a show more than a series. I want it to be a show, The Health of the Culture, where I am talking about everything help. I also don't want to just speak to providers. I want to also be able to speak to patients and that people, all people can find um, nuggets and find value in what I'm giving. And so you might have also noticed that the name is the health of the culture. Now, if you have not noticed, I am a black woman, okay? And I'm Southern, you know. My demographic has Tend, it tends to be black and brown populations. But this, if, if that's not you, I'm not cutting you out either. I want to just cover cultural things all across the gamut. So things for women, things for people of different races, things for people of different economic backgrounds, things for religious backgrounds and beliefs, all kinds of things that create culture because we're all a part of a culture. A, we're all a part of some type of culture. So this is going to be something that I just want to be able to have candid conversations. And, you know, my hope is that I will be able to have guests on and I can interview guests and we can have experts come on because I do have quite a quite an impressive Rolodex. So I really want to start out just laying the foundation and then later on having other people to join me. So with all that being said, that's what this is all about. Now, I have notes. Again, if you have followed me for any amount of time, you know that I'm not a person that reads straight from a script, but I am a person that likes to have bullet points, so I'm not rambling. I still tend to ramble, but I have the gift of gab. So 
if you like if you don't like people who are long-winded i'm probably not going to be the person for you uh currently i am recording this to edit it but hopefully i want to get to a place where i can do this live so i am trying to work on my brevity but if if it's too much for you i'm sorry also i am a wife and a mother so you may occasionally hear sounds and yells and maybe a kid may pop up on the screen or so i'm trying to do this while my family is down um, while they are having some downtime but you may hear people right now i hear a kid running up the stairs so you may hear that too okay again this is very laid back not to be stuffy um i'm going to be professional but again i'm not so professional like i'm in a suit and tie okay the last thing i do want to talk about i have a note here is that well the last thing of this welcome <laughs> is that this is really going to be more suited i want this to be more like a commentary style where i'm through my personal lens because again like i mentioned I have worked through a lot of different transitions. Um, at this point, I've been a nurse, a registered nurse uh, for almost 15 years. Yeah, almost 15 years come August. Well, there we are in August. <laughs> so literally, it's been almost 15 years I've been a, a, a registered nurse. And come December, it will be 12 years as a nurse practitioner and so you can only imagine i have seen a lot of different changes um in healthcare in the nursing space um when i came through undergrad it was the big the big transition was going from paper charting to um electronic charting um i've i've worked through that i've practiced through that um i've also currently what we're currently dealing with which i'm going to probably talk about on the next episode the fee for service model versus the value-based care model which a lot of organizations are going through right about now um so we're probably going to talk about that because i think as providers we do need to know the difference between the two and what the writings on the wall are going to be you know and i have had the opportunity to work with two large organizations that that has been their shift and i have looked i have noticed that there are a lot of organizations that are going to that model it's all about value-based care and it can be a little bit misleading um, I have found that a lot of my coworkers and colleagues are having a time transitioning from that fee for service because we honestly, in school, we weren't taught value-based care, kind of, but kind of not. It really was the fee for service model. So that's my last little bit when it comes to the intro. Okay, guys, we are now in the second segment, which I would like to say is the hot topic segment. So what my intention for this segment of the show is I present to you guys maybe an article that I have read that's in the news, um, something that is big for us as an industry, as a healthcare industry, that maybe we all should be leaning into things that maybe are new for our patients or for the patient, you know, if you are a patient listening to me, something that you should be mindful of. So I'm going to try to talk about something that is just that it's a current topic. It's a hot topic. So this is our hot topic section. Okay. Our segment of the show. Okay. So what is it that I want to talk about today? Um, I don't know about y'all. I'm in the state of Texas and it's hot y'all. It is hot here. And, you know, I got to thinking because on a personal level, you know, we, we as a family have been trying to stay cool. We've been swimming a lot. We've been going to like some of the uh, water parks and amusement parks around a town to, you know, we've been doing ice cream dates and all this stuff like that. But the reality is also I have had a lot of friends who have had air conditioned issues. Um, even last night, it was, I woke up in the middle of the night, kind of hot, and I was worried. I was like, oh man, please don't let our, our, our unit go out, you know, but it's been very hot. And here in Texas, I'm in the Dallas area and it's been 108, 107, triple digits. 
And so um, as I'm looking around and I'm looking at family and friends in other areas of the country, it just seems like we're in this heat wave. And so if we're in the heat wave, patients are also in the heat wave. So I wanted to really just kind of talk about like that when it ref when we're talking about our health, um, when we're talking about our patient's health and how we can help our patients um, navigate during this time because we're in August, which a lot of people consider August the hottest month of the year. Um, I've always known it to be the hottest month of the year. You know, it's a common thing. People consider it the hottest month of the year. But I wanted to give some information and I came across a really good um, a really good uh, article on Healthline. So I'm going to share that right quick. Um, and I will also um, do you all a fair one. Um, I will also put this in the description box if you want to read it yourself, because I personally am not going to read through this whole thing. But as I was reading through, um, as I was reading through uh reading through it, I just thought this would be really good, a good article to share. And it, as you can see, it was just released yesterday. And I, as I was planning for this um, episode, I really was like, you know, what's current? What is it? What's what we're all dealing with right now? What, what are we all dealing with right now? Well, we're all dealing with higher temperatures, okay? And this article, why your risk of having a fatal heart attack is higher during extreme heats. Now, let me tell you this. It just doesn't talk about extreme heats of extreme highs, like higher temperatures. It also talks about, um, also talks about like when it's really cold outside. It also talks about like air pollution as well. So if that interests you, definitely click the link, read it on your own. But what I am going to do is um, just kind of go through like some things that I thought were very interesting, things that I knew, some things that I didn't kind of know and some things that I needed to be reminded of. So one of the things about this article that it is, um, that it tells us, and I'm gonna put it like this, um, cause I don't want, I want y'all to be able to pay attention to what I'm saying as well. But one of the things that it talks about is that higher temps that are higher than normal, that they can put you put you and your patients at a significant risk for a heart attack. Okay, that's the name of the article, right? And why is that? So it goes through and it talks about like, for one, you're doing activities that will be a little bit, it, your body will feel like it's a little bit more taxed on. It's more taxing, right? And it was just saying that like, typic typically we know that our body is a wonderful machine it is a smart machine, you know, um, and it tries to respond to different outside, outside factors. You know, it's our body is always trying to keep us safe, always, you know, and I tell my patients that all the time, like your body is trying to, to, to get normalcy. It's always trying to be in equilibrium, whatever that is for what. So your body is constantly working. It does not go to sleep even when you go to sleep, okay? And so the thing about it is our, how our body responds to extreme heat is we know sweating. And we also know that our blood vessels dilate okay, especially close to the skin surface. And while that can be an issue, it can cause your heart to work harder during these times. So if you're in extreme heat for prolonged times, your heart is working harder, your body is working harder, which causes more taxing on the body, right? So heart is beating faster, heart is beating harder. And so to make sure that we're maintaining adequate blood flow, and of course, you know, this is going to make, put more stress on your heart, okay? And so something that is an obvious that we know that happens in, you know, when we're hot is we get dehydrated. Well, what does dehydration do, do to us? Well, we know that as we're sweating and we're losing that fluid, that we have to replace that. And that's the problem that I find a lot of people have. Like even myself, like I I actually track my water to make sure that I am actually getting more water than I'm supposed to get, especially during this time. I always tell my patients this, you know, there's this rule of thumb. Um, the ADA put this out. This is actually a recommendation. You know, 
prior to seeing this, and I always have to dispel this myth, there's this thing in people's mind that you're supposed to drink eight glasses a day of water. But what that does not do is take in consideration that we're all different sizes and shapes and have different body compositions. So eight glasses for everybody, there's no one size fit all. So the better recommendation, the recommendation is to drink your body weight in ounces. So if you're 200 pounds, you need to be taking in a minimum of 100 ounces a day. Now, when it's hot and you are sweating more and you're outside, you need to take in more than that because you're losing more, which will cause you to be dehydrated. Why is dehydration a problem? Uh, well, for one, just keep in mind, which I tell my patient, what goes out must come back in. If you're losing it, you got to replace it, right? And what dehydration can do, well, one of the biggest causes is that it can it can lead to syncope. So I like how it references it reference it here. And so let me find it here where they talk about right here. It says dehydration can lead to a syndrome known as syncope, where a person loses consciousness due to lack of blood to the brain. Extremes of heat, particularly dehydration, can exacerbate issues of syncope. Okay, dehydration and reduced blood flow to the heart can also indirectly make blood more prone to clotting potentially leading to blockages in coronary arteries, thus triggering a heart attack. And so this is very important, okay? Now, of course, and let me try to, let me try to, just to show you here. So we're talking about hot weather. Um, again, just to let you know that this article goes into talking about cold weather, and then it also goes into talking about air pollution. So very great article, not a long read at all. And so if this is something that you are interested in, I say most definitely, I'm going to link it so you can read it, okay? Um, but this got me to thinking, so what, what are we, what are we to do you know, what are we to do and how are we supposed to educate our patients? I, my heart always goes out around this time of year, like extreme weather time. So the summer and when it's really cold, because especially with, I think of the elderly, I think of people who um, are part of low socioeconomic um, classes that are categorized that way. Um, and then just the normal person who just happens to have an air conditioner that goes out. And so we do need to talk to our patients, all of them, about what we need to do during this time so everybody can remain safe. Um, of course, like I said, my patients are patients that tend to have kidney issues. Many of them have kidney issues because of hypertension or diabetes. So I'm talking to them about a lot of medication safety, about you know, a lot of things. And so I made a list here, which is backed up by this um, article. So definitely, you know, read through it if you want a little bit more context. But I'm just going to give you, again, my personal lens. This is my personal lens and my commentary on it. And so um, what can we do? Well, first things first, if you want to prevent dehydration, you need to stay hydrated. And I've already mentioned that Truly the recommendation, it is not eight glasses a day. I am so, I shock people all the time when I tell them it's not eight glasses a day, okay? It's not, because people will show me, well, I, I drink a bottled water, which a bottled water, typically a standard bottled water is 16.9 ounces. I don't know if y'all know that, but it is because I monitor my water often. And so I know what my particular intake of water needs to be. So I have calculated how many bottles are for me. But a lot of times I'll have patients that'll say something like, well, I, th I drink like three or four of those a day. And I'll tell them and I'll calculate it, looking at their whole clinical picture. I'll be like, well, that's really not enough for you, actually. Actually, you know, you're a pretty big man, like you're 6'5 and you're 260 pounds, like you need a little bit more water than that, okay? A lot bit more, actually. And so going and talking to them and giving them tips of how to increase your water, because I think it's one thing to tell people you need to increase your water. Well, especially when you're thinking about the elderly or any 
I mean, not even the elderly, y'all. I'm not even 40 years old. And I'm I'm not even 40. I'm now I'm pushing 40, but I'm not 40 yet. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you right now, nobody wants everybody knows that you drink more water, you're gonna go to the bathroom more. And when you're dealing with a population, i.e. like 65 and older, who probably already naturally go to the bathroom more anyway, they, that doesn't sound appealing to them. And, and they're just like, I can't live my life like that because I'm already going to the bathroom a lot. And you're trying to tell me to do it. And so these are some of the tips that I tell people. So definitely I tell people you need to drink half of your body weight in ounces. So I gave you the example. Let's have, let's say you have a person that's 200 pounds, half of 200 is 100. So you need to drink 100 ounces minimum, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you need to go and drink 300, but when I say minimum, that needs to be the minimum that you take in. You may want to do 150, you may want to do, I don't know, but during a time like during this time, it would not hurt you at all to do a lot more than 100 ounces. Now, here's the thing and here's the caveat. Most people are dehydrated. They're in a dehydrated state anyway. The majority of people are not even drinking nowhere near what they're supposed to be drinking. So that can seem very daunting to people. So what I tell people is work yourself up. So if you're drinking three bottles of water a day consistently, let's try four bottles for a week. Let's go up one bottle and let's work your way up. And here's something that a lot of people don't know, too. If you're consistently drinking more water, your bladder naturally stretches where, yes, initially you will go to the bathroom more, but eventually you won't go as much. Now, you're going to be going more than what you're currently. So if you're going two, three times a day, initially you may be going double that, but then once your body gets used to that water intake, it'll come back. But it's always going to be more than what you initiated because you're probably already dehydrated. So you're going to be going more. But drinking more water, your body needs it. It craves it. You're going to feel better. Your skin's going to be better. You're going to be healthier. You're going to have more energy. Water is like the miracle. It is. So I give people tips of how to increase it. I just don't tell people drink more water because... I mean, how? How, how, ma'am? How do I do that? Okay. Um, also, staying in cool areas. So, being in air condition as much as you can. Um, also, being in shaded areas. So, for me, growing up in the South and growing up in a big family, we have family reunions. Family reunions were always done in the summertime. It was kind of used as people's like vacation. And so, part of part of uh, 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 family reunions, there was always a cookout. And that cookout always happened outside. Well, in times like that, try to be in shaded areas, under a carport, under a tree, in a shaded area of the yard, um, under a pavilion if y'all are at a park, something like that. I always tell people stay in shaded areas. So stay in cool areas. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that like my family, we've gone to amusement parks. We are big amusement park people. We have se season passes to Six Flags. And one of the things that I absolutely love that Six Flags does now, which I remember being a kid, they did not do. You were just outside in the heat, uncovered in the line, but they do this now. A lot of their lines are covered. A lot of the waiting, like the line portion is covered and they have mister. So they have these big fans that have like water being missed on people and they're all around they're just not in the lines but they're also around the park so you know thinking about that having a fan there's lots of portable fans now um we just me and my husband came back from new orleans around fourth of july and lots of people have portable fans around their their necks and misters and stuff so there's so much to keep you cool um, also, for those who are active, what I, which I always suggest people to be active, modify your workout. Now, I'll give you an example of myself. I'm a person who I walk, I run, I do stuff in and outside. I work out. I have a Peloton bike in my house for when the weather is too bad. But then I also get up very early in the morning and I walk around my neighborhood. There's a trail that's near my house. Um, and with that being in mind, more so than not, I have to get up early in the day if I want to work outside or decide to work out in later in the evening. And 
why that's the truth, because that's another point that I have on this list, is that you want to avoid peak hours. Now, peak hours now are considered 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., but I remember a time, because I remember seeing this on Oprah when the Oprah Winfrey show was on, that peak hours used to be considered 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and that that's the hottest part of the day. So you don't want to be doing stuff outside for prolonged times during that time. That doesn't mean you can't go outside. It's just that you don't want to be working out during that time because that's the hottest part of the day now. So that's another tip. Um, of course, when it goes without saying dress cool, light colors, um, thin materials, um, you know, especially when you're going in and out of outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. Some of these places have so much air conditioning blowing that you can be inside and be cold at your job if you go to church or wherever. And, you know, just keep that in mind that you may want a white jacket while you're inside, but you really want to take that off because you don't want to be overheating your body. And then lastly, um, listen to your body, you know. Um, you can tell before you get the heat exhaustion, um, before you're just extremely exhausted, your body talks to you. Like again, like I said, the body is very smart. So listen to your body. If you're starting to feel a little faint, a little lightheaded, you know, get somewhere, sit down, get you some water in you. That's the quickest way that you can start to recover, you know, making sure you're staying hydrated, making sure that you're eating well. You know, as well, because I know people can skip meals. You don't want to do that either. Um, and so those are my tips. And that, y'all, that's my hot topic segment. Okay, so our last segment, and I'm going to do this, my uh, my hope. Well, it's not, it's more than a hope. <laughs> this is my plan for this. I want to be able to do an intro. I want to be able to do a hot topic. And then I want to close out the episode with a diabetes corner, a need to know info corner. Um, again, I'm Kim E, the diabetes MP baby. So I'm going to have to give y'all a little some, some, a little yang, yang, yang to what you will. So when it comes to diabetes education and management, okay? So um, I want it to be relevant and I want it to be something that we can all use. And um, if it is relevant to your practice that you can walk away with this. Again, what I'm about to share, um, I am going to link it in the bio, uh, not only in the bio, but also in the description box, depending on where you're going to watch this, because I'm going to stream this to YouTube. I'm going to stream this to LinkedIn, as well as Facebook. And then I'm going to do clips on Instagram. And so I'm going to make sure wherever you find links, whatever platform you're on, you're going to be able to find this link, okay? And so with that being said, we are going to talk about back to school tips for people who have diabetes. And this is really good for the clinician who takes care of children, um, people who, um, any of your patients that are going to school, um, whether that be grade school, high school, or even college, okay? And so, or even if you're an adult that has decided to go back to school, you know, um, this could be something to um, think through as well. And I'm actually going to share, uh, let's do it right let me add it right here now and let me take off so you guys oh, well i don't think you can see it so i wanted to share some back to school tips um, from the ada american diabetes association and i will say reading through this um this is probably more geared towards the child that's in school, so your elementary school, middle school, junior high, high school students. But as we go through this, I do kind of want to like talk about it as if like if you're a person that's sending your college age kid off. Because one thing that I find as well, especially for those who have children that have diabetes, once they get older and they have to go off to school, that's a transition for them. Not only are they leaving your home, they're going to need to be locked into like the health, the student health center. They need to know where they need to go if they have an issue. 
they're probably needing to probably have a doctor wherever they're at. So as we're going through this, I'm going to kind of talk through it through that lens as well. Um, and not just from like the school age kid. OK, the child. OK, so first up, it talks about making sure that you have a current diabetes medical management plan, a DMMP. And so they actually, which is so nifty here, and I think this is about, I don't know if you guys can see it. No, it didn't pull up, but um, it is, I want to say it's like eight pages long. So if you don't, if you are a person who um, have never heard about a diabetes medical management plan, um, they have a sample plan for you right here that you can, you know, fill in. It's just like a form and that you can actually give to the provider that's taking care of your child. If your child is in elementary school, there's a school nurse, like you should be able, you should be able to have a plan of like what your family would like to happen for your child and what, what, what's that medical plan and management plan, right? It is by law too, that you have, that the schools have um, an individualized education program, writing up a 504 plan. Like if you have a kid that has diabetes, like the staff needs to know how to take care of your child in a, in a case of emergency. Um, they legally have to know that. And that and you would think that that's a, a given. That wasn't always the case. That was not always the case where it was just kind of like whatever the parents told the people at school is what happened. Now they know they should know who has diabetes they know they should know who takes what medication where it's stored the teacher should know other support staff would know and it talks about like finding the 504 plans and your sample plan as well okay um something else um that i also encourage people to do is to really team up um with the school staff you know, like it's it's not to me, it's not enough to just like, hey, this is what I want you to do for my 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 kid. You know, something that me and my my husband do, our kids don't have diabetes or any diseases that require medication, you know, daily at school. But something that we always tell the teachers, the you know, any of the staff is that we're here to partner with you. So like we're nothing but a phone call away. If y'all need us to pop up there real quick, we're here. So I always tell people and encourage people like take the role of you being a part, a part, a part of a partnership with the school staff as well. Um, something here that I really liked here, and I saw it being uh named differently. Um, it says don't forget the lows, but they um something that I saw that I really like is having like a low box, which is like a hypoglycemia box. So if your child or, you know, if your your child has lows, what's going to, do they have on their person how things to treat that, right? Or I would say most definitely it does not need to be in the nurse's office. It needs to be on that child. It needs to be like in their bag, honestly. You know, for me as a parent, I would I wouldn't feel comfortable if it was not, I, it wouldn't need to be on them. It would need to be like, you need to be taking this around. Cause at any point in time, you can have a low episode, a hypoglycemic episode. And if you're having to run to the doctor, you can pass out in the hallway. And so, you know, my, I would say definitely teaching your child what's in it, how to keep it stopped. Um, what's the order? What would you take first? You know, um, and I really like that. They said, be sure to have a low box containing snacks and glucagon with your child in the classroom and in the nurse's office based on what you outline in your care plan. So even here, they're saying have multiple, have it on your child, but then also have it at the nurse's office. I think that's a great idea. And so um, just backing up here, if we're speaking about a child or, or a kid that's going to school, you know, going to college, you know, definitely all this stuff is still relevant. You know, I would definitely, as a parent, want to contact the student health um, center and see who's there. You know, what, 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 what kind of programs they have. I'm almost positive that they probably have a protocol for them. I would, I cannot see a college health student health center not having some type of protocol already in place because they already know they're going to get kids that are going to have 
all kinds of, you know, chronic diseases, type one, type two, even, um, and, uh, and a plethora of other, you know, conditions. And so I would call ahead to actually, you know, you know, once I found out where my child was going, that would be probably a part of how I would help decide if my child is going to go to that school, because I need to know that you're going to be safe when you go to school. If you're not going to be at my house, I need to know that these are people who are going to not only you can go to them, but they'll also be trying to give you support as well, reaching out or whatever. So I would want to know that in addition to giving my care plan, my medical management plan, what are y'all offering? What is your protocol there? Um, same here. Like I said, that kind of lumps that in this portion right here. And then even with your kid, letting them know, because, you know, I remember being in college, you ain't got a lot of money, you know, <laughs> you don't got a lot of money. You know, you, you got your dorm room. You don't have a big refrigerator. If you have a mini fridge, you know, um, you can't keep a whole bunch in there. And so like being realistic of like how the college student eats. You know what I'm saying? And making sure, you know, I would be even a person that would even want to know what their nutrition. Now, I would think that the health the health center probably could give me some insight there. But if not, you know, calling the dietary services and saying like, hey, how are y'all going to accommodate my child? This is what, you know, um, I, I don't see that being an issue. But I would definitely, that's something that you want to plan ahead for. Um, this says building up your child's confidence. Well, all of that starts, yes, when they're young and being able to have these talks with them, you know. Um, so they also say here, listen and reassure. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the other things that I was thinking as I was looking through their list, I was also thinking like to know, to have a low box, your child definitely would need to know what the symptoms of hypoglycemia are. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as a provider, we should be addressing hypoglycemia with, with all our patients, especially if they're on a medication that could cause hypoglycemia. So these are your medicines like insulin, sulfonylureas, excuse me, but maglutinides, which I don't really see that. So I don't really see those anymore, but definitely sulfonylureas, definitely insulin. You most definitely need to be addressing hypoglycemia in, at, at every, patient, uh, every patient visit, but they need to know the symptoms of hypoglycemia, right? And then also <clears throat> staying well throughout the year. So we know that with diabetes, no matter what type you have, you are in an immunocompromised state. So most definitely you need to be up to date on your vaccinations, great hand hygiene. And I know for those who go to college, there's a battery of different vaccinations that they want kids to have. Your child needs to have all of that because they're going to be sharing space now with people. They're no longer in your house. They're in a dorm. So they're going to have a roommate maybe a suite mate. They're going to be sharing bathrooms with people they don't know, okay? Planning to stay the healthiest that you can. Um, definitely hitting nutrition. <clears throat> I, I think I would take it even a step further, which I know this is recommended. It's recommended. But getting my child, if my child's going off to college, getting my child um, their own doctor, because at this point, you're not really going to a pediatrician anymore. You're going to a primary care doctor. So I would want my child to be locked in. I would actually probably want my child to have a primary care provider as well as an endocrinologist while up there. And, if, and also seeing if there's a nutritionist that I could at least get my child in initially so they could help my child with the food that is offered on campus. How do you navigate that? Because <clears throat> especially your first year, you know, the freshman 15 is a thing, y'all. Like, it's a thing because you're there. You don't have anyone to tell you that you can't eat. You don't, you just eat a lot of stuff that at your parents' house, you probably wouldn't be eating. And because you don't have a lot of money, you know, even for the kid that comes from, you know, a good background financially, you know, kids are, they're eating junk. You're up late at night. You're drinking a lot of caffeine. And I'm just thinking about what, how I was when I was in school. 
We were in the library studying and pulling all nighters and living off of caffeine and, and, and junk food a lot of the times because a lot of the stuff wasn't even open at certain hours. So if you missed the hours of the different dining halls, well, you had to go get the junk. You know what I'm saying? And so we know that this is coming. We can anticipate that. And so having your child locked in with a nutritionist, at least at the very beginning, would be very beneficial so they can know like, okay, if I do have lows, I can go to this like corner store or I can go downstairs at the store that's in my dorm and get this, this, and this, and this, you know, like that would be very beneficial and setting them up for success, which ultimately, like this says, builds your child's confidence. Okay, guys, that's all I have. I hope you all like this new um, show on this channel. I am going to try to um, keep this going and this be my main um, content on this channel. I am going to, I understand that some people don't like the long form and they don't have time to like sit down and watch like a 45 minutes, an hour of something. So I'm going to Put up the long form from beginning to end for those who do like it. Because I know for myself, I like long form content. I love to have it in the background while I'm doing stuff. Even when I'm working at my desk, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening. I'm listening to YouTube channel videos and stuff like that. But I understand everybody's not like that and everybody doesn't have the time for that. So I'm going to also try to chop this up as well so you can get the smaller <clears throat> smaller segments as well. And this is what I plan on doing, like moving forward for some time. Um, I just want to really offer more than just diabetes. Again, it's not going away because I am Kim E, the diabetes MP baby. So I'm going to give you the diabetes tea, but I also want to have a more creative out uh like uh what outlet that's the word i'm looking for where i can share more things and i can talk about more things you know again i know that um i know that there are people who you know their whole focus is just diabetes and i've tried that i've done that for four years but there's this thing in me that wants to talk about other stuff because again my day-to-day -day is not just diabetes management. Like I manage people's cholesterol. I manage people's hypertension. I talk to people about their heart issues. I do a lot of care coordination, period, and have for like the last 10 years where I'm connecting the dots. That's why y'all hear me talk a lot about social determinants of health and how to connect the dots and how to get into the community and things like that, because that's what I do. That's really what I do all day long is connecting the dots for patients. You know, it's not just me seeing a patient and then coming back and prescribing something. I, I mean, I, I can do that. Yes, I do that. Yes, but I also am making sure that they are at the right specialist and making sure that they're staying, they're not having any issues. I'm doing a lot of education and a lot of community work. And so I want to be able to share all of that. I want to be able to share all of myself. Um, because I've just realized that if I'm going to be doing this, I want to make the content that I want to talk about. And I hope you guys can do that. So, you know, hopefully you'll stay around. I understand for those who want to leave if y'all don't want to hear anything else. But again, like I said, I've been doing this for well over a decade. I have a, I, I do believe that I am a wealth of knowledge and I want to be able to share all the things that I know um, and the things that I see, you know. So anyways... You've been sitting here with Kim E, the Diabetes MP. Do me a favor. If you're not already, follow me. I don't know where you're watching me from. If you're on YouTube at my YouTube channel, Kim E, the Diabetes MP, go ahead and subscribe and ding that notification bell. For those who do that, when I do go live, you know when I'm going to go live. And so if you want to see it live, you can do that live or just to know when an upload goes up. So there you can follow me there. Also on um, Facebook, I'm also Kim E. The Diabetes MP. I think if you also search me on LinkedIn, I'm Kim E. The Diabetes MP. On Instagram, I am The Diabetes MP. Uh, and so yeah, you know, follow me there, all those places. And again, all these links, these articles that I shared with you guys today, I'm going to make sure that they're linked 
for you guys. Um, so you can read on your own and then go down your own rabbit hole if you want to. Okay. So anyways, guys, thank you all. The plan is to put this up on Sundays. I want to do it on Sundays. May have to do some Mondays. But again, I'm a working nurse practitioner, a wife and a mother and a business owner. So please be patient with me and have grace on me. But my hope is to get this up on Sunday, Sunday evenings. And as we keep going, we'll get a little bit more... <clears throat> You know, we'll get more consistent. Um, I can have like an actual time, day, all that stuff that like that for you. Uh, that's my hope. And so anyways, you've been sitting here with Kimmy, the Diabetes MP. I'll catch you on the next one.